This is usually a political podcast where we unpick the policy and posturing of the week, but yesterday it all changed. One moment we were watching the brand new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, announcing a hugely significant emergency bailout to try and prevent mass fuel poverty over the winter. And just hours later, she was making a speech outside number 10 about the death of Queen Elizabeth II. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. And I don't know about you all, but a lot of the messages I've been receiving and conversations I've been having with friends and family and colleagues and contacts even, people have been describing having a very strange feeling as well as sadness. And I do think the passing of an era like this makes us feel profoundly strange. Um, And at a time of national mourning, it is inevitable that we think of our own loss of our own loved ones. We can relate deeply with Mm. that rush of the family to the bedside. I know I, I certainly thought that when I was watching some of the rolling coverage. But for me, it was the quote used on the Telegraph front page this morning. Grief is the price we pay for love, which the Queen said when her husband, Prince Philip, died, that is most moving. And surely everyone who has been through a bereavement can relate to that. Um, And Andrew, you spoke very movingly on your LBC show just last night, just before the news broke yesterday evening, I think, of the Queen's personality and how such a big part of her reign was how she ran counter to our sort of modern culture of individualism to suppress her beliefs and who she really is. So I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that reflection, but also a bit about who she really was. Well, um, like all journalists who come on and talk about who the Queen really was, I don't know, um, because I didn't spend time with her one-to-one or anything like that. I mean, I followed her a lot for three big documentaries I made, and I wrote a book about her and talked to many friends, but I don't want to pretend to be, you know, the, one of those sort of shadowy palace insiders, because <laughs> I ain't. Um, what has struck me, however, watching her, is that we all grow up in this culture where we are sort of told the greatest good is to be yourself as vividly and extremely, in the sense, as we can. It's a cult of individualism, and the best, the best life is to decide who you are inside and express it as fulsomely and eloquently as you can. And that is a relatively new thing. That comes about in Western societies kind of after Romanticism and the various um, uh, feminist and socialist revolutions that follow that, this individualism. But, you know, historically, you were what you did. If you were a shoemaker, that's who you were. If you were a priest or a a grandmother, or if you were a farm worker, that actually expressed the essence of your personality. And it's not until we get to the romantic poets that people are beginning to break out of that way of thinking about themselves in the world. Very like, in in many ways, the traditional Indian Hindu caste system. You are what you're born into. And if you look around the world, there are very, very few people who still think in the old way. You know, there may be some religious groups around the world, but very few people, particularly in the Western world, think that way. And I think the Queen was almost unique in that, from a very early age, with a kind of very sober... Uh, sort of girlish dedication. She dedicated herself to the role. She was absolutely convinced that uh, God had given her the role. There's no metaphor, there's no joke about that for her. That was that was how it was. And the kind of person that she was in public uh, was not like the person she was, everyone says, in, in private. She was much funnier, much more um, quite hard-edged uh, in, in, in private, very, very bright, really understood the details, the weeds of politics. She got every week this very detailed and sometimes quite gossipy, salty account of what had really been going on behind the scenes in Parliament from one of the whips. And she always read it. She knew what it was about. But in public, she was absolutely sub- you know, the sobriety, the mask of duty, um, relatively rarely smiling at it official occasions, going through the endless, utterly exhausting, wearisome, bone-chilling round of handshakes and processions and standing around that she had to do. I think she subdued herself to the role. As far as she was concerned, she wasn't important. The role she was performing was. And I think that's almost unique and something we can all think about, if I put it that way gently. But you mentioned the emotional feeling. Yeah. And I should, as it were, (coughs) confess that as nobody's idea of an ardent monarchist, I found myself when I was on LBC announcing the news yesterday that the Queen had died. I knew I was going to crack up, and I did. I choked up when I had to say the words, you know, we we have to interrupt this programme to say, to tell you that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died um, at the age of 96. And I thought to myself, 
why am I so emotional? Why can I not stop my, my, my voice cracking and some tears coming to my eyes? And Anush had it exactly right. It was because I was thinking of my own father's death two years ago. Um, and that sense, and, and that's interesting, I think, because in a way, it's a, it's a hackneyed, cliched phrase, but she was a kind of mother of the nation. And I think something is, that is worth talking about today is what it's been like for Britain to have a female head of state. Simon Sharma wrote a very interesting piece um, for, the New, for the Financial Times in which he was saying so many other countries around the world in the 20th century and early 21st century, when they want to show how big they are, how strong they are, how much they matter, they put on huge military parades of missiles and tanks and they kind of bark um, at each other and they, they wave flags and they march up and down. And we have kind of have tea parties and Paddington and that is a better way of being. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know for me, whenever I read about the Queen or see the kind of things that you've that you've just illustrated there, I always think of my own grandmother because she grew up with the Queen. And, you know, it's a topic of conversation every time I go and visit her. Every time we spend Christmas together, we always watch the Queen's speech. So for me, she's more associated with my grandma, perhaps the grandmother of the nation. And Megan, I want to bring you in on this because you are our international editor and you can give us a sense of how the world has reacted to this news, but also how they see the Queen, what role she plays in their lives. Yeah, so I think at the moment, probably what we're seeing around the world is kind of indistinguishable from what we're seeing in the UK. I mean, front pages are covered with the, um, wonderful portraits. You know, we're seeing flowers and tributes around, at the embassies around the world, um, you know, from Tokyo to Washington. So that's really incredible. And I think worldwide, everyone's kind of responding Respecting and, and recognizing the historical moment. But that said, obviously, everyone feels differently about the Queen than the British do. So while there's a lot of admiration um, and I think a lot of affection for her, there isn't the same kind of deference. So I think the conversation around the world will move on quite a lot more quickly than it will in the UK. So... Um, yeah, the, the period of mourning will be much shorter, if you would even call that, outside, outside. And especially for, you know, the 14 countries that are constitutional monarchies and for which the Queen was head of state and now Charles is the head of state. I think the conversation will, will move on even, even faster now. Yes, I, I, it really struck me. I was watching some of the coverage last night and, it, and uh, somebody said that uh, the Norwegian news had stopped and was just, uh, you know, had stopped normal broadcasting and was and was um, was reporting on this story, which I thought was really interesting, because can you imagine here us stopping our normal broadcasting for the death of any other head of state around the world? Probably not. And actually, there is that phrase that you often hear, no, in, you know, in American films and stuff, who are you, the Queen of England or, you know, richer than the Queen of England? England and she is very much sort of part of parlance globally not just in the UK yeah absolutely I mean um, I'm a Canadian so from she's been my head of state for my entire life she's on all our banknotes she's on all the coins so all of those questions as practical questions of will they put Charles on the, on the banknotes that those will all be conversations that will be happening in other countries around the world as well I mean there's clearly been a withdrawal from the idea of constitutional monarchy among many many Commonwealth countries, particularly in the Caribbean, parts of Africa. There's been a big Australian Republican movement. I wonder whether Megan thinks that this very sad event will actually hasten the withdrawal of the British monarchy as a kind of global institution. I suspect it will. Um, Canada, growing up, I, I can't really remember a Republican movement having any kind of strength. But in, in recent years, we've really seen, I think that's kind of, you know, gained ground a lot. Um, what was a, a recent poll said, um, I think only 34% of Canadians polled wanted to remain a constitutional monarchy under, under King Charles. So I think you'll hear louder calls um, and a lot of soul searching, kind of who we are now that will happen much, much more quickly in, in Commonwealth countries. And Rachel, we'll, we will be seeing some of that soul searching here as well. Um, but first of all, I'd love to know sort of what happens next practically. Um, do we know anything about the banknotes or the stamps uh, or even the funeral? We know a little bit, although much of it is, is speculation. Um, I think we're, we're, we're heading towards 10 days of, of national mourning 
here in the UK, the civil service is in a state that's sort of similar to Perda before elections, where they're still wor working and they're still operating. But um, no big statements, nothing controversial. Uh, and I think there has been some concern that if uh, n now is not the time to shut the government down for 10 days when we've just had two months of uh, a caretaker government, a caretaker prime minister, while we had the Conservative leadership race uh, and we're heading into a, an autumn of economic and energy crisis. We can't afford to suspend the workings of the government. So I think that pressure is going to come up against the um, very justifiable desire to show respect and, and give this this moment the kind of dignity and consideration that it clearly deserves it it is to be frank sort of not not ideal timing so i think there's going to be a balance between those two things um the we we, we know that her uh her her coffin is going to come down from uh, Balmoral on the Royal Train and there will be I'm, I'm sure lots of people going out to, to see that and it will be uh, displayed in, in Westminster for three days for people to go and, and, and pay their respects and I, I can imagine vast crowds there probably to pick up on what Megan was saying coming from, from all over the world um, as well. As for how much things are changing it's quite interesting. There are some things that have changed immediately. We have a king in this country, and that is a very, very strange thing to say. And it's particularly strange, I think, because we all knew it was going to happen. I mean, she was 96. Nobody lives forever. It's been clear for the last 70 years that at some point she is going to pass away and there will be a king. And yet it feels very, very strange to say a lot of the tributes coming in finish, finish with... God save the king. We have King Charles the Third. This is all just very, very strange. Um, the the bar association of, of barristers put out a statement pretty much immediately to say that uh, all individuals who had silk queen's counsel, the that that honour given to top barristers, they are now king's counsel. That has changed immediately. Other things will take longer. I imagine that the the banknotes and the coins and the stamps will be phased in gradually. Uh, but I think it is going to be very strange the first time you get handed a £5 note and it's got King Charles's face on it, facing the other way uh, uh, as well, which is tradition, that the monarchs alternate which, which way they face. So it's kind of like overnight a lot of the backdrop to our day-to-day -day lives that we don't really think about but that make Britain feel like home will change. And I imagine that it will feel a bit like almost stepping into a parallel universe, sort of Black Mirror style, where everything ostensibly is the same, but just little details uh, have changed. And I, I find that very unsettling, even though we, we all knew it was going to happen. I think that's absolutely right. We have no idea quite how weird it's going to feel. We will never, ever sing at football matches or wherever, God save the Queen. We will never turn on the television at Christmas for the Queen's message. Um, I was wondering, you know, I, I've written a book called Elizabethans, and we have been, in a sense, Elizabethans. That was something that Churchill, her first prime minister, said, you know, we are now in a new Elizabethan age. And I was wondering what we are now, and apparently the official answer is we are Carolines, which I quite like. We are sweet Carolines. A lot of people thought he wouldn't keep Charles because there have been, if I may put it gently, some unfortunate historical precedents there. But he is, you know, he's not going to be another King Edward or another King George, which a lot of people thought was going to happen. That really struck me, that phrasing in your piece that you wrote actually for the Platinum Jubilee, Andrew, um, where you said about the second Elizabethan era coming to an end. And it sort of it was the first time I suddenly felt that I am living in history. You know, I always had one of those wooden rulers with all of the kings and queens on it. But I for some reason, I never thought that there would have to be a, another notch on that ruler, if you see what I mean. And it's suddenly you're, you're part of an era that will be in textbooks as the second Elizabethan era. It's in many ways, it's a very strange way of identifying historical periods. You know, what, hmm. who happens to be a monarch at the time, um, you know, as, as compared with centuries or whatever it might be. But in a way, it's also quite a human thing because it is a human lifespan from that very hierarchical, almost overwhelmingly white, uh, imperialist, much more military, much more ordered um, sort of 
buttoned up, um, less emotive society that the Queen was born into to where we are now, where I think the first time I really noticed it was at the uh, after the death and then the funeral of Diana, because suddenly the streets of London were covered with... The, I remember the Duke of Edinburgh said, there's a very sinister sound sometimes in the middle of the night, and it's the, it's the, the wind on the cellophane wrapping around the tens or hundreds of thousands of flowers um, in front of Buckingham Palace and up and down St James's. And suddenly the whole country was out on the streets and there was, you know, people were, were wailing and hugging each other and in tears in public. And somehow it felt kind of Mediterranean compared to the old British way of doing things. And the fact that she has, as it were, taken us or been there all the way through that period from one, is, a, is a human lifetime. And I thought in, in some senses, therefore, the word Elizabethan is absolutely perfect. Mm. And and I did want to pick up on something Rachel pointed out, which was um, very important about the stability. Uh, obviously, it's another cliche, but people talk about the Queen as being this figure that unites the nation has, and has been a constant throughout most of our lifetimes. Um, this is a difficult period for the UK. And Andrew, you said yesterday that we were sort of very lucky um, to have a monarch like the Queen who was prepared to completely suppress her opinions, um, but you said her son yes. Charles is another matter. I wonder if you could reflect a little yes. bit on that, because, you know, he's he's been so long in public life. He's been waiting to succeed uh, the throne for, for decades. So we know a lot about him. You know, perhaps it's inevitable. We know his passionately held stances from the campaigns that he's that he's pushed over the years. How can he shed all of that when he succeeds the throne? Well, it's a really good question. I mean, it would be unreasonable to expect an intelligent, uh, interested person to get into their 70s without saying anything, um, you know, because they're waiting for a different job. Um, I spoke to um, Sir Nicholas Soames, former Tory MP, former uh, Defence Minister, um, and, of course, the grandson of Winston Churchill, uh, her first uh, Prime Minister, and he, he said two things which really resonated with me. First of all, just going back to our conversation about the length, the span that she, she connects to, was that he told a story which hadn't been told before, which was that when his grandfather, when Churchill finally ceased being prime minister, um, the Queen attended a very private uh, dinner in his honour um, at uh, Downing Street. And there weren't going to be any toasts. But the Queen suddenly stood up and, and, and toasted him as her greatest prime minister or great prime minister. And he then got up um, in his full fig of kind of um, court dress and said that he was and, and he said, I'm going to uh, make a toast to our new queen, our young queen here. And I'm going to use the same words that I I toasted um, Queen Victoria uh, in 1870. So he had actually given he had toasted Queen Victoria. And so this guy who had been fa fighting with a, on a on a cavalry charge with a sword at the Battle of Omdurman, um, toasts the Queen, and the Queen lives long enough to make Elizabeth Truss, who was not alive when the Queen acceded to the throne, uh, born in the 70s, her uh, 15th Prime Minister. And that just gives you a real sense of the, the, the scale of time. that there, is a, there was a living connection with the Victorian age, not the beginning of the Elizabethan maid, but the Victorian age. Um, so that was one thing. But the, sorry, the other thing about... Um, Nick Sams was that he knows uh, Charles very well, Prince, uh, King Charles, I keep saying Prince Charles, King Charles, King Charles, um, was best man at his first wedding and so on. And he says, I can absolutely assure you that Charles thinks an awful lot about his new constitutional duty and he will never cross any of those lines. You will not hear him talking in public about his interest um, in sort of environmental depredation or architecture or any of those kind of things. He understood absolutely that now he's king, all of that absolutely stops. Now, I think that's very important because if it carried on, if we got more of those black spider letters or the new king summoning ministers to lecture them on his views on organic farming, or whatever it might be, that I think would be lethal to the monarchy, really, really dangerous. So um, what Sermons was getting is that he gets it, the new king gets it, and he will be very reticent, and he will follow his mother's example, rather perhaps than his own instincts. That's so interesting, isn't it, Rachel? Because we've been through this period recently of instability, of crises, constitutional crises as well. And with the, you know, breakup of the union now, not impossible. And, you know, with a monarch like Charles, can we expect him to 
can we expect him to treat these kind of issues in the same way that the Queen has, where you know that she is advising behind the scenes and, and, you know, occasionally you get front pages that suggest that politicians are embarrassing the Queen and then everyone sort of, you know, gasps and and takes a pause and, and hopefully we try and use our strange constitution to muddle through it. Do you think that kind of thing will be as possible with, with King Charles? It's a it's a really interesting question. I mean, to, to just go back to what Megan was saying about the uh, reaction from across the world, including from the other countries where she is their monarch as well, or she 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 was their monarch, I I, I should say. You have to think if you were designing a constitutional political system in 2022, you probably wouldn't come up with uh, an elected prime minister and a constitutional monarch uh, with a, a, an aristocratic family with lots of palaces. Um, you, that's that's not the model that you would if you would come up with if you were starting from scratch. And yet, what is sometimes quite difficult to explain, uh, say to Americans, for example, or people who come from different political systems, is that strangely in the UK, it seems to really work. The, I mean, the separation of head of government and head of state is, is not unique to, to monarchy at all. Other countries though, have an elected head of state and strangely, ours works. Having that continuity figure, not having that role being uh, elected, um, gives you that sense of stability, that sense that even in the midst of political turmoil, and there has been an awful lot of political turmoil recently, there are some things that are certain and that we can rely on. Now, it worked partly because, as Andrew was saying, she she lived and she reigned for so long, and obviously that was quite unusual to ascend to the, the throne in your 20s and, and have a 70-year reign. Um, so, you know, part of that is, is timing. But another part of that the reason why it worked was because she took that role of unelected, chosen by God, perhaps, but not chosen by the people, role very, very seriously and was so careful that her uh, influence was about continuity and stability, not about making her own opinions felt or, or interfering in, in politics. And there are a few instances, perhaps, over the course of that 70 year reign, where perhaps the line was very slightly blurred. And she seems to have realised, or those around her realised very quickly, that they were on very dangerous ground. Now, Charles is obviously in a much harder position because he has he, he's an adult in his 70s and he has made statements and he has had opinions as is his right you can't go as as Andrew said for, for your entire life never saying anything in public uh, but I think in order for the monarchy to work in the UK let alone anywhere else there has to be this understanding that it is a role completely separate from politics and the value in it is in that uh, symbolic nature rather than having that kind of I I impact in, in what's going on. And without that, if that starts to even look in doubt for a moment, I think the whole thing will, will fall apart very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm, I'm reassured by uh, a a Andrew's um, uh, co comments on, on uh, Soane saying that he, he, he gets that, because I do think that's very important. I don't think it's so much the case that constitutional monarchy works for Britain, rather that the, the version of female constitutional monarchy pursued by this particular queen has worked for Britain. I don't think we can draw big lessons about what's going ahead um, beyond that it has worked with this particular woman doing the job in this particular very restrained way. Um, we, I think we can draw no lessons for the future. It wasn't just the restraint, however. I mean, this she's a very, very um, devout Christian and at periods in our history where perhaps our public life, our government has seemed a bit harsh, then by and large, the royal family have leaned, I wouldn't say leftwards, but in a, in a, in a more kind of pro-charitable, pro pro-people at the bottom of the heap, pro-people just getting on and helping one another direction away from the world of money and celebrity, rich though they are beyond belief. And I think therefore the way that she has done it has worked for us over the past um, number of decades, that doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. And you've described yourself as a queen just... rather than a constitutional monarchist, I think, on that exactly. note. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> the queen's version of constitutional monarchy has also worked for 
much of the Commonwealth and the other countries, international countries who, who have her as head of state. And Andrew, you made the point that, you know, the Queen had made a, a, a her life's mission, basically, to suppress her, who she was in, in service of her role. So really, the world doesn't know who the Queen is as an individual, but the world feels they do know who, who Prince now King Charles is um, because of the era that we live in with tabloids and social media and celebrity interviews and Oprah. So the rest of the world feels that they have an idea of who the rest of the royal family is. And it, I think it will be a real challenge. And I think the existential challenge now to, for King Charles to not just within the UK, but on a world stage to show that he is the king. He is the head of the monarchy. He is no longer an individual. And what I wanted to ask you, Megan, was that I know that um, the New Statesman International Desk has been discussing about how this could possibly be seen around the world as the end or a significant turning point in Britain's imperial age. And that's something that you've been talking about with your team. Could you say a bit about what you're planning to cover in terms of that? Yeah, so um, our writer at large, Jeremy Cliff, has um, just filed a piece that will be up shortly um, on Elizabeth as the last living link with an old imperial Britain. And he makes a really good point is that even as she, you know, became the monarch, that era was already on the way out. And her long reign of 70 years has seen the place that the UK has taken on the world stage shrink. You know, and there's, you know, for better or worse, that, that is the reality. And we look at, it's not just, it's not just scandals or, um, I mean, scandals, I mean, Windrush scandal think elements of that, the darker side of, of the empire. It, it's also just the way politically Britain has, has been seen on the world stage. We look at, we look at Brexit, we look at, um, you know, the role the military plays. It just, the, the Britain of today, of the end of her reign, is just a starkly different place than it was when she became queen. And it's just, I mean, when we talk about the sense of history of this moment, it's just, it's really hard to, I think, kind of wrap your mind around the changes that she has seen and that, you know, the UK has seen. Yeah. And just lastly, I hope this isn't a self-indulgent question, Andrew, but I mean, having been at the BBC for so long, you must have been drilled in all of this and it must feel strange that the day has actually yeah. come. Yeah, um, it certainly has. And people have been waiting for it and preparing for it. And as I think Rachel said, it's hardly a surprise. She was 96. <laughs> you know, these things happen. And yet I think it took everyone by surprise when it actually did happen. There was a very strange moment, um, uh, Anush, I know, uh, w was witnessing at the time, when we were all watching this really, really important announcement of the massive, eye-wateringly big package of support from the new government, the new Prime Minister Liz Truss, to get British families and businesses limping through this winter with unpayable energy bills. And it's a really important political... And it was a very, very interesting clash of ideas in the House of Commons that we were all gripped by. And then suddenly in the middle of it, um, Nadim Zahawi, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, sitting on the government front bench, got a bit of paper and started to pass it around. There's a little bit of a flurry. And then the paper was passed to the opposition front bench. Keir Starmer was in the middle of explaining philosophically why the government was wrong. And his deputy, Angela Rayner, who's very much to his left, was sitting just behind him, got this bit of paper and her face just fell. We have this expression, ashen faced. And for the first time, I began to understand what it might mean. And then she passed the paper to the shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, who was sitting next to her and her face fell. And suddenly, within a few seconds, nobody in the chamber seemed to be listening to what this very, very important, one of the most important announcements we've yeah. had for years in the House of Commons, and everybody was ignoring it. And this kind of ripple went round, ripple of our knees went round, MPs started to leave. And we were sitting around saying, well, could it be the Queen? Is it a terrorist attack? Has another politician died suddenly? What's gone on? But it was absolutely clear. That was the first moment that we realised 
And, you know, everything since then in Britain has been different. You know, the uh, schools are going to carry on. Flags are going to be flying at half mast, as Rachel was saying. But, you know, businesses, most businesses will carry on. Our television is going to be different for quite a while and every aspect of our life. But that's how it started. And one final interesting fact, Liz Truss got the news um, formally at 4.30 in Downing Street. In other words, an hour and a half before it was announced. So whatever uh, the Queen's death clearly happened earlier than we realised. And I wonder whether some of those very carefully modulated palace announcements about, you know, she's under medical supervision, she's comfortable, were the palace's way of saying, folks, it's just happening, it's happening right now. Mm. It was quite a day. Yes, that's how it felt, isn't it? Well, I will let you all get on with your days because it's a very busy news day, of course. Um, Thank you so much for joining us on the New Statesman podcast.